to this point in the course, we've been focusing on how to choose investments that earn good returns. Very early in this course, for example, we learned whether it's possible to earn returns that are better than the market return. And then, in just about every lecture covering the various instruments, we've learned something about the returns. For example, we learned about dividends as a source of good returns, as well as a signal of good returns to come. And we learned about bonds that offer returns that keep up with inflation. All this talk about returns, though, should make you start to wonder where the risk is. After all, if somebody's earning a return, they must be taking on some kind of risk, right? The relationship between risk and return is something we hear so much about that we actually tend to take it for granted. Everyone seems to know that as you bear more risk, you'll earn a higher return. But let's take a step back from the cliché for a second and ask a couple of questions. First, do we even know what we mean by risk? And second, what if our belief that higher risk leads to higher returns isn't actually true? Well, I hope that second question got your attention because it really isn't true that higher risk leads to higher returns. This catchy statement is a big oversimplification of the true relationship between risk and return. Financial economists have spent decades thinking about risk and return, and what they basically found is that not all risks are created equal. Some risks are highly rewarded, while others are literally worth nothing. Wouldn't you like to know which ones are which? In this lecture, we're going to take a deeper look at the relationship between risk and return in investing. We'll learn a more accurate way to think about this relationship, including what kinds of risk are rewarded. And I'll explain how the risk-return relationship frames your investment choices. To get started on this, let me go back to the first question I mentioned a minute ago. Do we really know what risk is? Well, sort of. Investments are risky because their returns are random. They're determined at least partially by chance. To illustrate this, I gather data on a single stock, the Kellogg Company, from one of the free financial websites. I downloaded the monthly adjusted closing price from Kellogg for the past 20 years. I'd like to have the annual prices, but most websites only give you daily and monthly data, so I calculated the annual return on Kellogg myself where the annual return is simply the percent change from the January 1st adjusted closing price in one year to the January 1st adjusted closing price in the following year. Here's a bar graph of what these annual returns look like. Wow, there are some really high returns in there. Two of them are over 40%. But there are also some big negative returns in there, too. Three of them were losses of more than 10%, and one of them was almost a 40% loss. Plus, there doesn't seem to be any real pattern there. The returns bounce up and down unpredictably. Notice how this randomness, or risk, changes our understanding of returns. So far, we've mostly been talking about investment returns as if we know what they're going to be. But it's hard to look at this graph and conclude that the return on Kellogg will be, say, 5% next year. Actually, based only on looking at the graph, I can't make a sensible guess at all. Next year's return may be great, but it may be awful. And yet, we need to try to say something about next year's return, because returns are one of the most important factors in our investment decision. We have to find some way of guessing what the return on an investment will be so that we can make a good decision about whether to buy it. Now, we call our best guess of an investment's future return the expected return. Because if it's really our best guess, it represents the return we truly expect the investment to deliver. There are several possible ways to calculate the expected return on an investment, but the most practical way is to use the average of past returns. That seems sensible, but it's actually a lot harder to put into practice than you might think. It's not because the calculations are hard. I think you'll agree that finding an average return is easy to do. No, the hard part is simply deciding how much of the past you want to use in your average. Do you use the past 10 years, like mutual funds are required to do? Would 20 years be better? Or why not only the past 5 years? The problem here is that there are two opposing forces at work. Statistically, if everything else was equal, then you'd get the most accurate guess of future returns by using as many years of past returns as you can. But the problem is, everything else isn't equal. 
In particular, companies and the entire economy can change dramatically over time. For example, think about a company like IBM. Twenty years ago, IBM was one of the big producers of desktop and laptop computers, as well as a producer of hardware and software for large mainframe computers. But today, IBM doesn't produce com personal computers at all, and most of its revenue comes from consulting services. It's hard to think that the returns on IBM that they earned in the 1990s, when it was still relied heavily on PCs for revenue, do a good job of representing its returns today or into the future. So we need to limit how far back we go in time when we calculate average returns. Now, I think it's good to try to go back further than 10 years into the past, for even, perhaps even out to 20 years. That's because using more returns than the average should allow the short-term ups and downs to cancel each other out, leaving a clear picture of the long-term average return. And as we've seen during the last half century, it's possible to have both bull and bear markets that last for 10 years, which tend to distort the average level of returns. If we can include up to two decades of returns in our averages, then we can be more confident that we're seeing the average return over the full range of market and economic conditions. If the company and the economy don't change too dramatically, then looking at the average returns over several different horizons up to 20 years could be helpful. For example, I collected some numbers on the returns on Kellogg's stock over the past 20 years. Kellogg's business has certainly changed during this time, but its main business still seems to be one of selling cereals and other breakfast foods. When I calculated the average returns to Kellogg's stock over longer and longer periods, here's what I found. Now, each of these averages represents the compound average return over the most recent 5, 10, 15, and 20-year period. As you can see, the average return changes as you include more of the past, but not in a predictable way. Notice that the most recent 10-year period seems to be much higher than all the other averages, so if I simply use that, I'd probably overestimate the return. Based on all the averages, especially that 20-year average, I'd say that the expected return to Kellogg is somewhere in the high single digits. Maybe 7% would be a good guess. Now, I'm not using any formula to get that 7%. I'm just eyeballing the numbers and hoping that that 20-year number actually lets the true average come through, as I mentioned a minute ago. Once we've estimated an expected return, it's essential to realize that we can't think of the expected return like it's the actual return that we automatically earn every year. Again, think about how much the actual return bounces around from year to year. The expected return is an average return that we should expect to earn if we hold the investment over a long period of time. Now, this is an extremely important point because I think that many people hear the term expected return or average return and automatically believe that the investment delivers this return, just like clockwork. When people believe this, they tend to panic when the investment has a really bad year and shows a big loss. A lot of people will then sell their investment at this point, locking in that loss. But if you understand what's going on, then you also know that big positive returns are possible from year to year. So that if you hang on to your investment and resist the urge to sell, you'll probably experience positive returns in future years that will pull your total return up to the expected return. This discussion of the expected return already gives us one correction to that catchphrase, higher risk, higher return. The return we're talking about is not the actual return, but the expected return. If there's any relationship between risk and return, it'll be between risk and expected return. Now let's move on to think more carefully about exactly what risk is and how we measure it. That'll help us find the relationship between risk and expected return. When people use the word risk, they really mean the possibility that something bad will happen. In the context of investing, the bad thing we worry about is losing money. In other words, we worry that the value of our investments may fall so that we suffer a loss, which is a negative return. So to put this together, one way to sharpen our definition of risk is to say that it's the possibility of earning a negative return on our investment. But even that definition of risk is still not quite right. We've just learned about how investors come to expect a particular return from each of their investments. 
So a bad outcome occurs when an investment's return doesn't live up to its expectations. An investment could return 5% in a year, but if we expected the return to be 9%, that's still a bad outcome. So risk is the chance that our, that our actual return will fall short of what we expect it to be. Let's try to visualize this idea of risk by writing down the actual return on an investment as the sum of two parts, the expected return on this investment and the unexpected return. So we write RI is equal to EI plus UI. The unexpected return could be positive or it could be negative. Again, I write this as R sub I equals E sub I plus U sub I, where R is the actual return, E is the expected return, U is the unexpected return, and the subscript I references the type of asset that this is. So each different subscript refers to a different asset. Now that we have a better picture of what risk really is, it's simply getting a negative value for this unexpected return, which we've called U, this is a step in the right direction. But we need to refine our measure of risk by adding in something specific about the size of that unexpected return. And we can do this in several different ways. One easy way is to go back to our set of annual returns and use the range between the highest and the lowest returns to get a feel for the size of the unexpected return. Here's a table in which I've already ranked the annual returns over the past 20 years on that Kellogg stock. Now, one thing that really jumps out when you look at this ranked list of returns is that the overall range of returns is really large. It runs from minus 39% to positive 49%. Looking over the actual returns like this gives you a better feel for how bad things could get because it shows you how bad they've actually been. Now, on the other hand, the list of returns also shows that positive returns outnumber negative ones, and this is generally true of stocks and other investments. So the picture we get is that returns can be all over the place, but if you hang in there, eventually you'll experience a greater number of positive returns that will eventually outweigh even really large negative returns. You may remember all the way back in my very first lecture, I said that time can be your greatest ally when you invest. Well, that's another way to see why this is true. So far, we have an idea of risk in terms of how bad things could get, and that's useful. But hopefully these really big losses are fairly rare. What we'd also like to know is what the average level of risk is in our investments, how big the unexpected return U is when we have a bad year but not a disastrous year for one of our investments. The average level of risk is really how most professionals view risk, and there's a term they use for this average level of risk that you may have seen or heard before. The term is the standard deviation of returns, and it has a fairly precise statistical definition. Since this isn't a statistics course, I won't get into the details of how it's defined or calculated. But as I just mentioned, it's a useful concept that tries to measure the average size of the unexpected return, or in other words, how much the actual return could differ from the expected return on average. Most spreadsheets have a built-in function to calculate standard deviation for you. So if you have a list of annual returns, like the returns I showed you for the Kellogg stock, it's easy to calculate the standard deviation of returns using this function. We can use the standard deviation of returns to form a range of average returns. To construct this range, we take the expected return and add the standard deviation of returns to it to get the top end of this range. Then we sub subtract the standard deviation of returns from the expected return to get the bottom end of the range. Now, there's a well-known rule of thumb which says that about two-thirds of all returns will fall within this range. So we should expect to see lots of returns throughout this range. For example, returning to the Kellogg returns, I use a spreadsheet to find that the standard deviation of returns over the past 20 years was 20.8%. So the average size of an unexpected return on Kellogg stock is 20.8%. Now remember that I also said that my expected return for the stock was about 7%. Therefore, the lower end of the lower end of the normal range of the risk on Kellogg's stock would be 7 minus 20.8 or minus 
That's still a pretty big loss, but it's much lower than that 39% loss that could happen. Besides, the flip side of this calculation says that gains of up to 27.8%, that's the upper end of the range, should also be fairly common. Hopefully, this discussion has given you a more concrete understanding of what return and risk really mean for investors, as well as how we measure return and risk in practice. Now that I've introduced the concepts of expected returns and unexpected returns, I'm going to use them to discuss diversification. Diversification is a useful risk management tool for sure, but it also reshapes our entire understanding of risk and leads us to refine our understanding of the relationship between risk and return. We've probably all heard about diversification, perhaps in the context of investing or maybe even in some other life situation. Diversification is often defined as not putting all your eggs in one basket, and this phrase is a decent description. Diversification is simply the practice of investing in several or many different assets, rather than only one or a few assets. One way that investors diversify is by investing in different kinds of assets, stocks, bonds, and real estate, for example. Also, we've discussed reasons to diversify geographically by investing in foreign stocks and bonds, as well as domestic investments. Diversification is simple to envision, and actually even fairly simple to implement in practice. You don't actually need to hold that many different assets to become fairly well diversified. And these days, there are many assets that already come pre-diversified, especially mutual funds and ETFs. I think diversification has become so widely accepted and practiced because it's fairly easy to understand how it protects you, at least on a very basic level. As the phrase, don't put all your eggs in one basket, suggests, if you divide all your eggs between a lot of baskets, then if you drop one basket, you still have eggs in all the others. But diversification isn't just about making sure that you limit your total loss by spreading out the risk. Diversification actually reduces risk in a particular way. We can see how this works using expected returns and unexpected returns. Now remember that we can write the actual return as RI equals EI plus UI where R is the actual return, E is the expected return, U the unexpected return, and the subscript that references the type of the asset is I. Suppose I only hold one asset, call it asset 1. Then the actual return is going to fully reflect both the expected return and the unexpected return on asset 1, and I have to live with whatever unexpected returns I receive. But now think about adding another asset, call it asset 2, to my investment portfolio. If I assume I invest half my savings in each asset, then I can calculate the total return to my portfolio by simply adding up the returns on both assets and dividing by 2. Then my total return is given by this equation. The total portfolio return is half of R1 plus R2, which is then half of E1 plus E2 plus half of U1 plus U2. But notice that U1 and U2 are unexpected returns. They may each be positive or negative, or one may be positive and the other may be negative. When one is positive and the other negative, then they tend to cancel each other out, at least a little. Of course, with only two assets, they'll only cancel out part of their unexpected returns part of the time. But what if I added several more different kinds of assets, maybe a dozen or more? The more assets I add, the more offsetting of unexpected returns I'll get. In other words, if I'm holding lots of different types of assets, chances are that several of them have positive unexpected returns and several others have negative unexpected returns. So I'll get more unexpected returns canceling each other out as I add more assets of different kinds to my portfolio. That's actual risk reduction. And that's how diversification works. By holding more assets of different kinds, the influence of unexpected returns on your portfolio actually declines. The actual return isn't pushed as far away from the expected return as before because the unexpected returns are canceling each other out somewhat. In other words, the range of variation in the returns on your portfolio falls, which means that your actual returns are closer to what you expect to receive. Now, 
Does this mean that if we continue to diversify, we'll completely get rid of unexpected returns and all risk goes away? Well, I wish the answer was yes, but unfortunately it's not the case. There's a limit to diversification. Even if you have the most well-diversified portfolio out there, you'll still experience unexpected returns. So diversification reduces risk, but can't eliminate it. There will also be problems if your assets really aren't as different as you thought. For example, suppose you invest in the shares of Coca-Cola and also Caterpillar. These are pretty different industries, you think, so it seems like a good step toward diversification. But what if it turns out that both, com both companies' profits are heavily dependent on demand in China? Then their returns could move together a lot more than you expect, including their unexpected returns. It's important to make sure when you diversify that the returns of the assets that you're buying really don't move together very much. Correlation is the statistical term that describes co-movement. Two investments whose, whose returns both go up and down together are said to have highly correlated returns. So what this means is that diversification works better as the correlation between the assets' returns declines. This idea about correlation and diversification actually helps to explain my previous point, which you're hopefully still wondering about. Even after you fully diversify, there will still be unexpected returns in your portfolio, driving the actual return away from the expected return. How can that be? Well, the answer is that there are two different types of risk in unexpected returns, and diversification only gets rid of one of them. The type of risk that diversification reduces through this cancellation process is called idiosyncratic risk. It's called idiosyncratic because it's specific to each particular asset and doesn't share anything in common with any other assets. This means that idiosyncratic risk is not correlated to cross assets. When we increase the number of assets in a portfolio, we expect that on average the idiosyncratic risks will cancel each other out. The actual return will get closer to the expected return the more assets we include in the portfolio. The other type of risk in the unexpected return is called systematic risk. This is a risk that's common across assets meaning that when this risk creates a positive unexpected return in one asset, it's doing the same thing to all other risky assets as well. By saying that risk is common across assets, we're saying that diversification won't reduce it. So in a very real sense, systematic risk is risk that you can't get rid of through diversification. What causes systematic risk? Well, that's an issue economists still can't quite agree on. There are lots of ideas, but they all seem to be similar. Because investment in financial assets is ultimately tied to real assets, as I've mentioned in previous lectures, just about all investments are exposed to fluctuations in the overall economy, such as the business cycle, and perhaps also to fluctuations in the financial markets that connect businesses with households. So most theories about the sources of systematic risk involve risks to the overall economy, or to financial markets, or to both. This distinction between different types of risk changes the way we perceive risk, but it also changes the way we value risk. Now, economists know that people are risk-averse, meaning that we don't like to bear risk. But if you compensate us, we'll bear it. And if there's a risk that we have to pay to get rid of, we'll probably put up with at least some of it. But if there's a risk we can get rid of for free, there's no way that any risk-averse person would pass up the chance to eliminate that risk. Well, diversification gets rid of idiosyncratic risk, and it's basically free. You don't have to pay extra to diversify your portfolio, especially if you choose a pre-diversified asset like a mutual fund. Therefore, there's no reason to expect compensation for bearing idiosyncratic risk. You can get rid of it for free. Systematic risk is the risk we can't get rid of. So in order to induce a risk-averse person to hold an asset with systematic risk, then they have to be compensated for that. And the compensation comes in the form of a higher expected return from holding that asset relative to an asset with no systematic risk. Well, now we can finally restate our catchphrase about risk and return correctly. Rather than higher risk, higher return, the truth about risk and return is higher systematic risk, 
higher expected return. First, you only get paid to hold systematic risk, not all risk. And second, you can only expect to get paid, you won't necessarily get all the compensation you demand. And of course, if you hold the asset long enough, then your actual compensation should come close to the expected return. This still leaves an important question unresolved. What is the compensation rate for bearing systematic risk? Well, the answer depends on what you believe is the source of systematic risk. There are many different theories about what determines investment returns, but they all agree that idiosyncratic risk is worthless, while systematic risk is compensated. And they all agree that any asset that has no systematic risk should earn the risk-free rate of return. That's the return on a government bond. Even an asset with a highly risky return should only earn the risk-free rate on average if all the risk is idiosyncratic risk. Each different theory of returns is essentially a different story about systematic risk that explains what the sources of systematic risk are and how the risk is compensated. Unfortunately, we don't have a universally accepted theory of systematic risk. Some economists believe that there's a single source of systematic risk, but they can't agree on what it is. Other economists believe that there are several sources of systematic risk, and they can't agree on a common set of sources either. And none of these theories has proven to do a much better job at estimating expected returns than using averages of past returns. The distinction between systematic risk and idiosyncratic risk is still useful, though. We can benefit from this insight even though we can't take full advantage of the idea. I think that even though we don't know for sure how much systematic risk is in any given asset, there's probably a fair amount of idiosyncratic risk in most investments. Therefore, it's absolutely imperative that investors take advantage of diversification, which reduces idiosyncratic risk regardless of whether we know what the sources of systematic risk are. Remember that you'll earn nothing from holding, system, from holding idiosyncratic risk in your investments. So try to get rid of as much of it as you can through diversification. Well, this practical advice brings us to the end of our discussion of risk, return, and diversification. It would have been nice to be able to give you some very specific advice about how to concentrate your portfolio in the risks that earn high returns. But as we've seen, one of the main effects of risk on investing is that it makes it extremely difficult to draw any precise conclusions about future returns, including expected returns. That's a permanent source of frustration for all investors. But don't let this stop you from investing. We've learned a lot about how to deal with the presence of risk in our investments, and now your job is to put these lessons to work. First, try to use several historical averages of past returns to get a feel for the expected return on an investment. Also, try not to think about expected returns as a single number. Instead, think about a range of returns that you should regard as ordinary or usual. To find this range of ordinary or usual returns, add and subtract the standard deviation of annual returns to the expected return. If the lower end of this range of returns makes you nervous, then find assets with lower risk. Also, if you're already holding an asset that experiences a large negative return, hang in there. Wait for the asset to experience the higher returns that should come along and balance it out. Next, try to choose investments that are risk-return bargains. These investments offer relatively high expected returns and relatively low standard deviations of returns at the same time. But be aware that other investors are also looking for these bargains. So if you find one, you'll need to act fast to buy it before other investors drive its price up. And finally, don't try to guess which investments have high levels of systematic risk even though these assets should theoretically offer better returns. Instead, focus your investing on diversification so that you get rid of unproductive idiosyncratic risk and leave only the systematic risk in your portfolio. If you take away nothing else from this lecture, you need to remember that diversification is the best way to ensure that you earn the expected returns that you're entitled to, given the systematic risk that you take on. Unfortunately, the real relationship between risk and return is messy, 
It doesn't fit inside the neat little cliché that most people use. But having a better understanding of the true relationship between risk and return will help you stay motivated to keep investing over the long haul, no matter what unpleasant surprises the market may deliver in the short run.